Welcome to today's workshop, Strategies for Enhancing Instructor Presence. And we'll be talking about instructor presence in all teaching modalities today. We also have a separate workshop on uh, specifically on strategies for enhancing instructor presence in the online course. And I'll touch on you know, the online course in this one as well, but I'm also going to be balancing that with face-to-face -face teaching too. Um, so building community and a sense of connection in your courses can influence your students' success. One way to help your students feel a sense of connection to you and your content is to build instructor presence in your course. So whether you're teaching face-to-face, -face, online, or in hybrid modalities, or high flex, um, in this workshop, we'll explore some strategies to help you improve student performance and engagement by boosting communication and building those strong relationships. Oops, sorry, duplicated that. I'll be your presenter today. My name is Amanda Smothers. I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. Um, I'll take questions again throughout the presentation. So if you have any specific questions related to what we're covering during the presentation, feel free to post it in the chat thread or you know, click the raised hand icon, um, and then I'll address those as they come up. In the text chat, if you wouldn't mind, um, tell us what your department or your division is, what's your role, um, and explain what you hope to get out of this workshop. And I'll give you a minute to, to do that so that everyone can kind of familiarize themselves with who is here as participants. And you can go ahead and keep doing that. I'm going to move on to our workshop objectives just so that we, um, for the sake of time. Oh, thank you, Farah. Um, Assistant Professor of Sports Management and Kinesiology and Physical Education. Great. Thank you. Um, and as those come in, I'll address them. Um, so in this workshop, we're going to talk about some practical strategies for how to communicate effectively and regularly with our students to show our students that we are present in the course in and out of the physical or virtual classroom um, to support our student success and to try to dismantle any needless barriers to student success as well. So what is instructor presence? Before we talk about strategies for enhancing instructor presence in our classrooms, regardless of modality, we should probably define what instructor presence means. Simply put, instructor presence means being there in your class, um, but it also means being actively involved in your students' learning and supporting your students' success in your course. Um, we also have nursing um, represented here today, hoping to learn some new ideas for online teaching. Great. Um, in the online learning environment, instructor presence also means that your students see you behind the screen as a real person there to help with their learning. So in other words, instructor presence is, is creating the perception for your students that you're a real person right there with them in the process of learning and that they can approach you for help when they need it, whether you're teaching them fully in person, virtually in a synchronous format, um, like in Black, uh, Anthology Collaborate or on Zoom or in Teams, or virtually in an asynchronous format. Um, so the set it and forget it mindset is an easy one to fall into when you're teaching online, but we can also fall into this trap in face-to-face -face teaching as well. It's tempting to just kind of set our courses up, plan it out, and essentially forget about it without it really engaging in the course. And this includes setting up, you know, online modules and then stepping back and disappearing from the course or planning out our face-to-face -face course and just sort of going through the motions of delivering the content or lecturing to students without really engaging students as active participants in learning or as individuals with different needs. And the problem with this mindset is that it has a detrimental effect on student success and teaching efficacy. 
Um, it's important for students to see faculty as engaged and present in their course, and active participation by faculty keeps students learning. In addition, faculty should be evaluating and adjusting their learning materials and their approaches continually in all formats so we can ensure students are progressing towards our learning outcomes. So the three main components of instructor presence include persona, social presence, and instructional presence. Persona is what it sounds like, the instructor's personality and teaching style. That's what gives our students an impression of who we are. It helps them feel more connected to us as their instructor. We can communicate this through our course by letting our personality show through, for example, in our physical teaching style and face-to-face -face classes, but also as well um, as through how we present our course in our syllabus and how we present ourselves in our courses. Blackboard space, um, one way to do this is an outline or an, in an online course is by including module instruction videos that feature you so they, your students can see you every week. Um, social presence, the second piece here means community building. So in other words, this is how we connect with students and vice versa, how students connect with each other to create a sense of classroom community. Providing opportunities for these connections to happen is important to keeping students engaged in the course and increasing their chances of success. And that also means being responsive to students through things like timely communication and expecting the same return. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, but we also want to build in opportunities for students to engage with each other directly and with us in each class session and make opportunities for connection available outside of the classroom. One idea that my students gave me that I now use is having my students, you know, those who are willing um, and able to exchange social media information and set up a communication network or a channel outside of the course so that they can connect with each other about the course, but that they can also connect with each other socially. Um, we've also got management and the College of Business represented. Welcome. Um, instructional presence is the last component here. Um, that's essentially your role or our role in facilitating our students' learning experience in our course. To enhance um, our presence through instruction, we want to think about multimodal learning materials that we could use that provide information in multiple ways, um, either through written, written communication, video, um, it could be audio, it could be images. For online asynchronous courses, which are kind of their own um, their own kind of um, challenge. You could provide students with maybe a weekly video of yourself explaining what they can expect from the course that week and the week's assignments, how to navigate that week's module lessons and activities. Um, and for face-to-face -face or synchronous online sessions, maybe you provide the same information, um, you know, course concept in multiple modalities to reinforce those concepts. So this is leading into our next topic, which is creating and sustaining connections in our classroom. Um, some examples of ways to create and sustain connections include getting, creating a getting to know you um, opportunity in the first day or the first week of class where students can get to know each other and you. Um, we want to make sure in these getting to know you activities that we are listening actively to our students and responding to them in kind so that they know or they can sense that we want to create those connections with them. Um, for an online asynchronous course, we'd want to encourage students to maybe share photos or videos to create more opportunities to get to know each other, to put faces to names. Um, and then finally, we want to um, encourage small group discussions in the first weeks of class so students can engage with each other in smaller conversations as they introduce themselves and, and really make those connections with each other so they feel more comfortable um, in the class as a whole. Another way to create and sustain connections is to consider doing an icebreaker activity to make everyone feel more comfortable. Um, as uncomfortable as icebreakers can be, um, it actually does what it says. It breaks that ice and then makes things a little bit more comfortable thereafter. Um, you can also encourage your students to come up with their own ways of, of building a sense of community. So for example, you know, that that idea of creating a group chat on social media or via text or video messaging so that they can talk to each other outside the classroom environment. That was a, an idea for my students. And then last but not least, you can consider also using a welcome assignment or a survey to ask students how you can best serve them. So ask students directly, what are their needs? What are their challenges? What are their goals? Uh, what are their obligations outside of, 
you know, my particular course. And then if we have that information, we can figure out how we can help them figure out ways to be successful in light of that context. Um, one way to engage students with the course um, is to connect the course materials also to students' interests. So use the opportunities that we've created to get to know our students at the beginning of the semester and then leverage that information into connecting our students' interests to learning materials and ac learning activities and assessments whenever it's possible and practical to do so. Um, and we can also share our own interests with students so that they can get to know us better. Um, another way to engage our students is to show them how course materials and concepts are relevant to their academic lives and interests. So what common college expectations, for example, do you have in your course that students might be expected to follow across their college careers? Or what are some skills and knowledge that will transfer to their other college courses? Or how could students connect with their learning in, in your course to their college major? Um, whether or not it's you know a requirement in their major. How could you help students make their own connections between your course and their other college coursework and academic goals? And then finally, emphasize the relevance of your course to your students' future professional lives. Help them think about how what they're learning in your course could apply to their future professional goals. And that goes back to the transferable skills that you identified for other co college coursework as well. Um, another way to create connections to future professions is maybe by connecting our course policies to professional expectations, which um, is typically a kind of a common thing, at least to um, communicate to students. Um, but just be sure that those ex expectations accurately reflect the workplace. And keep in mind that students are still in college. It's a learning environment, not a professional environment. So we, we should really treat it as such. Um, and additionally, we can build in some flexibility with our assignments or our course materials to allow students to really tailor their learning to their professional or their academic goals or their personal interests. Um, in addition to creating those connections within our course, we want to communicate with our students frequently and in multiple ways to maintain that instructor presence in our course. So um, things like reminding our students of upcoming deadlines at multiple points in class sessions, as well as in a weekly announcement. Um, or follow-up announcement on Blackboard, um, or announcing in class, but also creating an online announcement and sending an email when grades are posted and provide any ad additional instructions that students need to access your feedback comments or the interactive rubric if you use those. Um, you can also send reminders about your office hours, including information like how to make an appointment, how to get to your office space, whether it's in person or virtual, um, and in fact, provide students with multiple options for meeting with you, including different days and times, different modalities. Um, so, you know, a combination of virtual and face to face options to account for students, different schedules and obligations outside of our courses. Um, also communicate weekly learning plans in face to face classes or post a you know, weekly module introduction or overview for an online class. You can include connections to the previous modular unit so that students know how this upcoming course content builds off of what they've already learned in your class. Um, another thing you could do is to post an occasional midweek motivation message or video to keep your course fresh in your students' minds. So as, as students get deeper into the semester, their schedules are going to get busier. They're going to have a lot more on their plate, more assignments. Um, so building in motivation and engagement will help them remember to engage with your course learning and assignments and to reach out to you if they need help. Um, and then also just one last thing is, is to mind the frequency of your communications outside the classroom. Um, be careful of overkill. If you post on Blackboard or email too much, students will start to glaze over those communications. So make those, any communication to students meaningful and be judicious about how many you send out and with what frequency. Um, also, make sure that you communicate the best way for students to contact you, and that could be either email or phone or Blackboard messages or in your physical or virtual office hours or some other method. Um, so include that information in your course syllabus and your course announcements. Make sure students can find that information when they need it. Um, also, if you're holding virtual or physical office hours, list the days and the times of those office hours, how to set up an appointment or whether they can just drop in, um, how to connect with you, how to find your physical 
or virtual office space, and then repeat that information regularly throughout the semester. Remind your students of it. Um, and then also pull aside or target message to individual struggling students to provide that just-in-time support. <clears throat> you should also include your expectations for communication in your course syllabus and in your course's Blackboard space. Um, these expectations should include what your students can expect from you as well as what you expect from your students. So how should students contact you and what time frame should students expect a response before sending a follow up email? Um, what other ways can students get in touch with you if applicable? Um, and if you think it's necessary, you could also give them, I do this with my students, I give them an example email template to use when they email me. Um, and this can include any information that you want them to include in their messages to you, like their course and section number, their first and last name, you know, an email structure, content that you want them to include to practice professionalism and aid you in helping them, and so on, whatever makes the most sense for your course. Another best practice in communicating with students and, and maintaining that instructor presence in your courses is making sure that you respond to students' communication in a timely fashion. Um, that doesn't mean you have to be on call 24-7. In fact, please don't be. It does mean that you respond to all students' communications and you do so within a reasonable time frame. Um, and this is an example, 24 to 48 hours uh, during the work week is a reasonable amount of time to expect a response. Um, so make sure that whatever your time frame for responding, you communicate that clearly and frequently to students and then adhere to that policy. So make sure that you actually do respond to them within that time frame. Um, also hold regular virtual office hours um, or in-person office hours so students can meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, for virtual office hours, you can use um, web conferencing tools like Teams or Collaborator Zoom, or students uh, for physical office hours can come to your office space on campus. Um, if you're interested in virtual office hours and want or need more information on that, you can always view our virtual office hours workshop recording. It's on our CITL workshop, um, or you can contact me and I can point you to um, the link for that for details and tips on doing virtual office hours. Um, another strategy for increasing instructor presence is to use media to humanize your course. Um, and for by media, I mean particularly media with you in it. So a video of you um, whenever it's appropriate in your course. You don't have to have a lot of technology to do this. You can even just use your cell phone and record yourself there. Um, but adding personalized media for online, hybrid, high flex, face-to-face -face courses is a way to humanize and personalize your course. It can be especially useful for those of us who are teaching courses that someone else might have designed. Um, so it can be that piece that really humanizes the course and, and shows your presence in the course and puts your stamp on it. It can also help you put your own stamp on the course. It can help you show students that you're engaged with them, the learning material. Um, you can also uh, use media to record your feedback for students in video or audio format instead of or in addition to written comments for their either formative or summative assessment submissions or learning activities, um, and that'll fur further humanize your feedback too. <clears throat> um, an important component, speaking of feedback, to communicating with students is providing timely feedback for both formative and summative assessments. Um, so for formative assessments and learning activities, timely feedback is going to help students learn and grow ahead of the summative assessment, which will comprise a substantial percentage of their grade usually. Um, students need to receive that meaningful and, and expeditious feedback on those formative learning activities for them to be um, useful and for students to actually learn from them. For summative assessments, students need timely feedback so that they understand their grade and how it was calculated, and they also need your written or annotated comments to be able to learn and improve ahead of the next unit or module or, or assessment. Um, generally, Feedback on any assignment should be provided in a time frame that gives students time to address any concerns and to ask questions. A good rule of thumb is providing feedback, you know, no more than a week after the due date, but it might need to be more frequent if the course is delivered in an accelerated time frame, like an eight, um, eight week accelerated course, for example. Um, discussions are another great way to keep students engaged in the course and with each other and to engage with your students and demonstrate that instructor presence. 
Um, a tool that we have available is Yellow Dig um, that gamifies discussions, moves away from you know the kind of more standard one post, two to three responses per week discussion board um, on Blackboard. Um, students receive points for different activities in the discussion forum. Had they have the freedom to discuss whatever is applicable to that week's learning materials, respond to each other meaningfully. And you can reward students with particularly good discussion posts by responding to them or reacting to their posts. That'll give them extra points for the week's yellow dig grade. Um, you know, there's a lot of different options of discussion tools. Um, we're currently reassessing whether we're going to continue with yellow dig or use something that's you know similar to yellow dig in the future. Um, but um, any way that you can increase contact with your students and communication with your students is going to be beneficial. Um, some rules of thumb for participating in discussion boards or conversations would be to chime in with a comment or two every week, show your students you're also engaged that you, and also model for students the types of response, responses that they should be posting, but find that right balance between your participation in dis discussion boards um, and your students. So don't post too much or students might rely on you to carry the conversation. You might take away from the ability for students to drive the conversation, be a little bit more autonomous and create those connections with one another. Um, another way to encourage students to interact with one another um, and for you to respond to students' questions about particular learning materials or activities or assessments is to enable um, class conversations <clears throat> about a lesson or assignment for example, and then the entire class can see that conversation when they go into that item in um, Ultra. So next, we'll just go over a few ways that you can support students in their success in your online class. And I will leave a little bit of time at the end for any questions after the presentation too. But again, um, yes, uh, thanks Brittany for bringing that up. So the difference between formative and summative assessments. Formative assessments are, um, are assessments that are not necessarily meant to be graded, but they build up to that summative assessment and they give you an opportunity to assess students learning um, ahead of the summative assessment. So for example, um, you know, a, a weekly quiz or a daily quiz that leads up to um, an exam. So you're looking at, are students getting the concepts in these weekly quizzes? Is there anything that I need to readdress? Like, you know, none of my students or most of my students didn't really get this concept. I need to go back to that. So it gives us opportunities to gauge student learning ahead of you know, the, the major components of their grade, like a midterm exam or, an, or, or a test or um, an essay assignment. Um, so it's, you know, giving us information. It's also giving students information because we, we provide feedback on those formative assessments so that students can improve and grow ahead of that summative assessment before they turn that in. I hope that answers that question. All right, so, um, as I mentioned previously, you can conduct a survey to find out um, more information about your students at the beginning of the semester, but you can also use surveys to find out what students already know about the subject that you're teaching so that you know their level of prior knowledge. You can also ask them, you know, what they're trying to balance in their lives, um, what factors or challenges might impact their success in the course. You could ask them what technology they're using to take your course. Um, and that might come in handy if they have technical difficulties later on. It, it also will be revealing because a lot more students than you might want to think are doing courses, even online, fully online courses on their smartphones. Um, so the more information that you have about student circumstances early in the semester, the better equipped you're going to be to help those students succeed. Um, another way, great way to connect with your students and, and demonstrate your presence in your course and show them that you care about their success in your courses, holding regular office hours. Um, and ideally, office hours should be every week on the same days at the same times. You can require students to make appointments either, you know, through a shared document with your office hour schedule or using something, you know, a little more sophisticated that takes a little more time to, to um, set up, like bookings through 065. Um, you can also have a certain amount of office hours time set aside for drop-ins so students with last-minute questions come, can come in for assistance. 
Um, if you're holding virtual office hours in addition to or instead of physical office hours, make sure students know how to meet you there. Uh, whichever platform you use for virtual office, whether it's Collaborate or Teams or Zoom or something else, just make sure to remind students often how to make an appointment, what those office hours are, where to find that virtual office. Um, and one thing you might consider is requiring students to make just a short five minute virtual office hours or physical office hours appointment in the first few weeks of class so they can practice the process, get to um, know how to navigate it when they actually need that help later in the semester. Um, so that works for virtual office hours. So making sure that they know how to get to, you know, your collaborate office office um, or your Zoom office. Um, or, you know, if you're holding office hours in your physical office space and are teaching you know, face to face hybrid high flex, you can walk students to your office early in the semester so they know how to get there. Or you could require them to drop into your office in the first couple weeks of class to say hello and check in. Um, and if students have visited your office, whether it's virtual or physical office space already early in the semester, they're actually more likely to attend your office hours later in the semester when they need the help. Um, and I'm sure we've all experienced asking students in the end of a class whether they have any questions and getting crickets only to get an email or a message of a student later on to ask a question. And students might feel self-conscious asking questions in front of their classmates. They may need time to process or get started on their learning activity or an assessment before questions come up. Um, sometimes though, we get questions about things that students could find out for themselves just by like looking at the syllabus or the assignment sheet or reading a course announcement. So to try to head off those latter kinds of questions, you might want to provide a page in your online course space with frequently asked questions and require that students check that document first before contacting you with general questions about the course policies and procedures um, or require them to read through the assignment prompt before um, they email you asking questions about it. Um, you can also create a traditional discussion board in, in um, your online course space for questions and answers. Um, in the past, I've given my students a little bit of extra credit for answering their classmates' questions correctly, and that gives them the incentive to check the Q&A forum regularly. Um, make sure that you're also checking it regularly so you can answer students' questions and dispel any misconceptions. It happens. Sometimes students give their peers the wrong information. Um, maintaining the presence in that Q&A discussion board will show students that you're engaged in the course. It'll help you establish that, that presence outside of the physical classroom. Um, another way to support student success and maintain instructor presence is providing students with information about campus services and resources. Um, so you can consider including this information in your syllabus, but also having a section of your online course space dedicated to sharing those resources. Um, also, definitely be proactive in pointing students to specific resources throughout the semester as needed. So if you've got an essay due in a few weeks, highlight the Writing Center. Um, if you've got a test coming up, remind students about the Disability Resource Center and to seek out accommodations if they need them or tutoring center if they offer tutoring on um, your subject. Um, you can and should also target resources to specific students. If a student mentions to you that they're having problems with someone on campus and that's interfering with you know, their ability to be successful in your class, or even if it's not, link them up with the ombudsperson. If students are having technical issues, point them to the division of IT, do it. If a student approaches you because their dead name is on the course roster, give them the information that they need to change their name and pronouns so that that doesn't happen again. Um, also consider whether you have any discipline specific resources that might be useful to students. So some colleges, some disciplines have you know, their own tutoring centers or their own writing centers um, that are discipline specific or, you know, other things like that. But whatever the resources are, make sure you're pointing out specific relevant resources regularly to students as they might need them. And that'll show students that you're present, that you're invested in their success. Um, and then one last thing that I want to bring up is um, that students should be challenged by our course content but not by our course policies. Um, our students have various levels of personal responsibilities and coursework and job schedules and physical, mental, and emotional challenges that might interfere with their ability to succeed in our course. However, we can make it more likely that our students can succeed regardless of those obstacles 
by not throwing unnecessary barriers in their way. So for example, strict attendance policies may disadvantage students with a child or another loved one who gets sick and relies on them for help. Or it could get in the way of success for a student whose car breaks down on the way to school or who has a health condition or a disability that may prevent them from attending every class session. Um, requiring students to turn in physical copies of their assignments, particularly if they have to come to campus outside of your regularly scheduled class session to do so, might disadvantage students who work full time or are commuter students who aren't on campus every day. Um, it could also disadvantage students who can't afford to pay to print out their assignments. Essentially, what we want to do is we want to take a hard look at our course policies and practices and consider whether any of them might create unnecessary barriers to some of our students' success. And if so, how can we reconsider those policies and practices so that students have the best chance of success? For instance, instead of having a strict attendance policy, could we give all of our students a certain number of absences that they can use for any reason so that their grades don't suffer if they have to miss class? Or could we provide students with access to class materials in our online class space so they can stay in the loop about what they missed in a given class session? Or could we have a high flex option for our class where students can participate in a class session remotely when it makes sense to do so? Um, so really it's going to depend on what works best for your class, for your course, for your students, but just look at our, our policies and our practices and, and think about, is this putting up a barrier to my students being successful to their learning um, that's not necessary that I can change? Um, also, instead of requiring students to turn in physical copies of assignments, could we have an online Dropbox for students to submit an electronic or a scanned copy of an assignment if they need to? Or could they email us the assignment if they can't make it to campus? Um, I know there are some professors who prefer, you know, to grade on paper and they don't want to have to print out all their students assignments. Well, that's really an instructor's problem. That's not that shouldn't be the student's problem. So we shouldn't be inconveniencing our students. Um, or placing a barrier, unnecessary barrier for our students based on our own just personal preference. Um, as long as they're submitting the assignment, then we should give them that um, flexibility to do so in a way that doesn't create a barrier for them. And then finally, we also need to be cognizant of how we communicate with students who ask for exceptions or accommodations due to their own personal circumstances. Um, our course, as much as we wish it was, it's not the only thing going on in their lives, nor is it the most important responsibility that they have. So asking a student, for example, to prioritize my course assignment over the full time job that pays their living expenses or their tuition and fees or over their sick child is probably not the best approach to encouraging and eliciting student success and engagement. So being understanding, listening to our students concerns, adjusting our policies and practices where they create those unnecessary barriers, are all strategies that are more likely to promote student achievement and involvement and help us create those connections with our students that are very important to establishing instructor presence in our classes. So just to recap, um, we wanna communicate with our students often um, and, but you know, with the caveat of like too much email communication, might be glossed over. So figure out some different ways to communicate with students, figure out, you know, when we can condense that into one single communication um, versus, you know, communication every single day that they might, you know, just start to ignore. <clears throat> um, also, we want to provide timely feedback to our students. We want to use rubrics and provide individual feedback um, for each of our students, especially on those some those formative assessments that are leading up to that big assignment that they have, um, you know, if we give them a lot of feedback on those, then they're going to do better and it'll take us less time <clears throat> to grade those summative assessments. Um, also, we want to support our students. We want to use campus resources and reach out to individual students, um, let them know that we see them and we're here to help and point them in the right direction. We also want to reconsider un unnecessary barriers to student success. 
So with that, we want to review our course policies and practices um, and think about whether we are placing unnecessary barriers on our students and their success in our course um, and how we might adjust those policies and practices to ease those barriers um, or remove them altogether. And then finally, just one last thing is manage your own workload. Remember to take care of yourself. Um, you can't, you know, pour from an empty cup, like, right? So you need to be able to also take care of yourself. So don't um, run yourself ragged trying to be present 24 seven. Be present enough in your course, but also take care of yourself. All right, so I'll pause for a minute. Um, and if you have any questions either on the workshop topic today or if you have topic ideas for future workshops that you're interested in, please share those as well. Um, and again, thank you for coming to today's workshop. Um, I'm Amanda Smothers, Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. Um, those of you who are here today, um, in the virtual session, I will send a follow up email to you this afternoon with some resources and a link to um, the session recording. Um, and I will stick around to answer any of your questions or get any of your feedback after um, today. I wanted to make sure to give you plenty of time for that um, to ask individualized questions. So thank you all for coming today and have a great week if you don't have any uh, questions.